Welcome to Let's Talk Death, conversations to inform and inspire. Let's Talk Death is a series of conversations with some amazing people from various fields. Our goal through these conversations is to normalize, educate, and demystify the taboo around death, dying, and the journey of grief. Hello, welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Death. I'm Fran Solomon. And I'm Andy McNeil. And we're thrilled to be your host for these conversations. Let's Talk Death is brought to you by Heal Grief, a social support network creating community after someone has died. Everything we do is inspired by our core belief that no one should ever grieve alone. Our goal with this program is to have a friendly chat with some amazing people so we can help normalize and educate our Heal Grief community. Our guest today is Marie Antoinette Kelly. Marie Antoinette is an award-winning artist who has done hundreds of commissioned portraits and art for the Angel Quest Oracle. She has appeared on dozens of TV, radio, and podcast shows and has been published in such magazines as Edge and Authority. In 2019, her bison portrait in the form of woven blankets began selling throughout Yellowstone National Park's general stores. Today, Marie Antoinette comes to us as the author of Danny's Day in Heaven, inspired by Danian Brinkley's Saved by the Light. This illustrated children's book, Danny's Day in Heaven, introduces the near-death experience and offers an understanding of what happens when we die. Marie Antoinette, uh, we are delighted to have you as a guest on our show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, Marie Antoinette. Before we speak about your book, <clears throat> may I first ask, was there a personal experience that led you to write Danny's Day in Heaven? Um, thank you for asking that. The, that's um, somewhat of a complex question for me because I, as a child, I had a really strong connection with spirit without a real understanding of anything I was experiencing. And I think that was kind of the being left in the dark about it, wondering what happened with when you die and what is the spiritual realm that is talking back to me. Um, all that darkness made me feel like death was like a black hole that gobbled people up. And I started to be really afraid as a child. And that feeling carried with me for most of my childhood until I was a grown up when I actually was able to find the books that were written by people about their near death experience of what really happens when you die. And um, one such book was Daniel Brinkley's Saved by the Light. Uh, that was a, a New York Times bestseller. Um, he became my friend and um, in having that validation from him that, you know, you don't die, it isn't that black hole. And in fact, this is what happened. And, you know, that book explains it. The light went on inside of me and I was able to place my experiences and really, um, figure myself out more. And that made me let go of that fear of death. And it, it made me think, wow, if I had had that as a child, how different my childhood would have been. I would have been able to um, navigate it so much easier. And that was the beginning of me wanting to translate the near-death experience into a children's book so that children who are like me, having strong experience of the spiritual realm without a real understanding of it, um, could could be assured and could start to relax and navigate it with with a sense of freedom and acceptance so that they could be happier. And that's I, how I felt like this was one of my missions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it, to me, it's an interesting connection between to hear you talk about your childhood and, and having a fear, a fear of death. And it's actually it's a it's really a universal experience for kids. I mean, I know, I remember as a kid feeling that, yeah. that sense of fear, um, you know, yeah. really there's fear of the unknown, but then it's all the, but then it is very specifically around death because it's this thing that yes. happens you know, and, um, and you come to realize this sense of permanence and, and yes. you know, all of these things that are pieces and parts of that. So it, it is, it is interesting to hear you say that about your childhood and then now as an adult wanting to comfort kids, you know, uh, yes. around. Yeah. There was a lot of myself that I had to figure out in that context also, because 
I think children naturally, as you say, not just have a fear or a curiosity about death, but very many children have a natural affinity for the spiritual realm because they just, you know, came from there really. And their, their intuition and their hearts are so open. I think it makes it easier for them to make the connection until the rational mind is really developed and takes over. And um, today there's more information out there than ever. But when I was a child, it was still very, you know, strict patterns of, you know, either religious dogma or um, don't believe anything at all. And, and that, that gap was so big that you can't get a real flow going as a child. And my idea of writing this children's book is to make it natural for children, not just to understand that death is not the end, which is obviously the theme of the book, um, but to, to understand that spirit, the spiritual realm is a foundational uh, ingredient in our lives that underpins our, our, our existence, our, our everyday experiences, and that interacting with it um, is natural, and it's not scary, and it's not, um, you know, heavy, the way grief can feel heavy, obviously, but the way death is made to believe to be this, this you know, black hole, as I experienced it. And, and interesting you say that. Yeah. Um... As an adult, you know, I, especially um, being a mother, I, I believe that birthing is a very, very spiritual transitional um, event. Um, I also believe out of what I've learned actually through these conversations, that so is death. It's a very transitional, it's not just one moment someone yes one moment someone can be their body can stop working but mm -hmm. there's a transition under a natural course of death and um one of the things that one of our guests said he researched his patients in hospice and i believe elizabeth kubler ross also did very similar research mm -hmm. in that People that were in their end of life near death experience, mm -hmm. when they were able to share things that they perhaps were holding on to, mm -hmm. their transition was a much easier one than those who mm -hmm. couldn't. They led a much more agitated transition. Mm -hmm. We're talking here under help help me understand what what you're talking about when you say death is not an end and and I'm taking that into I assume it's a transition yes I as I um I believe strongly that spirit is the matter as yin is to yang and so I believe that you know we come from spirit into matter and then from matter we cycle back into spirit at the end of it and obviously I have fundamental reasons for why I see it like that but I do believe death is a doorway and having studied it for a lifetime now through my own experiences, as well as the near death experiences of people, um, the research is pointing to the common ingredients that people experience independent of cultural background or religious affiliation. And there are steps that really indicate that it is a sort of a birth into spirit that you let go of your body here and you, 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 you know, that tunnel experience of um, letting go of the physical experiences and, and drawing yourself into the spiritual realm and then waking up to your life review, seeing your entire life flash before your eyes as if you're experiencing it um, from your own point of view, simultaneously from the point of view of everyone you interacted with, that, that um, omniscience, that experiences a quality of spirit that everybody experiences as they uh, transition into the spiritual realm and um, meeting loved ones, meeting, um, you know, the feeling, the unconditional love. These are the ingredients that all the people that have been resuscitated from their death experience um, have in common. And that information points to the, the reality that there is a process we go through, that we fill in with our individuality, because I do also believe that the nature of spirit is being the, the yin and the yang of matter. Matter here is a um, objective experience that is described to us by science. It has foundational um, truths that we all build on and that we navigate through scientific understanding objectively. 
um, spirit being its equal and opposite, I believe is a subjective experience. And while it has these conditions that we all um, experience, such as unconditional love and um, the omniscience of it, um, the, the light of it, there is a subjective element that we all experience it in our own way through our own cultural or symbolic understanding through our religious backgrounds and we fill that light in with our truth from our hearts and that's the unique element of uh, being birthed into spirit you're birthed into your um treasures in heaven so to speak and um i left the book that i wrote um within here, here's the book is how it came out um, but the idea is, you know, once you sail into spirit and you're birthed into the realm of spirit, um, you fill it in with your consciousness being met with the unconditional presence of the divine. And so I didn't decide in this book what you're going to meet um, in terms of, you know, which religion is the best, which culture is the truth. It's your unique spiritual experience after you follow the steps of the death process which is that birth you talked about into spirit. So the book is describing those steps more than anything. It's a, it's a, do you want me to summarize the book in a few minutes? Well, please, or? Would, lo would love that. Andy, do you have a question on this? Oh, so I, I was, I was curious. I was curious about something and that's, um, so in, in a conversation, in this conversation and talking about um, uh, spiritual things and, and being a spiritual being, um, uh, I am curious about, so for me, I talk a lot, I do a lot of trainings on grief and bereavement, and I always include spirituality in my discussion mm -hmm. because I feel like we miss an important piece. If we only talk about grief as a mental, emotional, physical thing, it's also right. a spiritual thing. Right. And, right. and, you know, we're told, you don't you don't discuss religion in public. Right. So people go to support right. groups. And they they leave that piece of themselves out of the discussion. So I'm yeah. curious, just for you, um, and this is specifically really about your art and and how you know you described yourself as spiritual when you were a child, and um, how that has impacted your art and and just the other parts of your life, not just the thought about death, but how it's impacted life. If that makes any sense. What yeah. Saying. Yeah, I think you make a good point about people uh, in grief, in looking for support in their grief, um, missing something when they leave out their spiritual element. I, in reflecting on it and in my experience, I've come to believe that grief is actually the language of the body. And, you know, the process of letting go of the person that you have lost is a language of the body, whereas um, the spirit or the language of the soul doesn't experience grief because in spirit you experience oneness you experience um the opposite of the the chaos that we feel on this side of matter you experience the perfection of wholeness and healing and connectedness and so the more a person can connect to their spirit the the more complete their um grief will find a voice in their body and i believe that myself i have through my artwork, um, found a connection with spirit so that I can keep bringing more of that inspiration into my world and to you know, the person, the people appreciating my art so that they can begin to feel there's a language to spirit and there's a way that you can draw that inspiration to heal your heart, to feel the connectedness and to know you're not really ever losing anyone that you have loved. In my artwork, I'm a portrait artist and I have a lot of those experiences actually since I, I have come to understand the language of spirit um, personally. And so when I draw people's portraits, I find that if they are already passed away, their ego is out of the way and it's actually rather easy for me to connect with them. And that was my first real experience of taking the idea that life goes on out of my head as a philosophy, but actually to realize that oh my gosh, it's really, really, really not a philosophy. It's an experience. People do not die because they were communicating with me through the portraits in ways I'd never met. There was one man, he was um, 
Do you want me to tell that story? Is that please, appropriate? Please. Okay. One man, he was um, sick in the hospital. I had never met him. He was a several cities away, but we had a mutual friend. And I thought I would give her a gift to give to him to cheer him up. So I made a portrait as an exercise for myself, uh, which I do. It's called um, Quick Sketches. I do portraits of the soul. So I sketch people. I feel like I can make a connection with them by looking in their eyes because it's the window to their soul. And the more easily I can attune to their soul essence, the quicker it is for me to get the features in the right place and to really get them um, the accurate likeness. So when I was sketching this man, a sketch like that takes me about 30 minutes. When I sketched this man, um, I couldn't get him in half an hour. I had his features in the right place, but it was like a flat face. There was no life in it. I like to make my subjects really come alive on the canvas looking at you so that you can connect with their souls to get that spiritual bridge because everything in my life at this point is about that language. And I uh, couldn't get him. So I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? I, he has a block to letting his spirit shine is what I interpreted that to be. So I took about four hours to connect with his spirit because it's of the energetic realm where you don't need to be present with the person since energy is non-local. So I was able to feel his burdens and his, his whole um, malaise, so, so, so to speak, the reasons why you can let his soul shine. And I, I say prayers when I feel that to shift it, to let spirit take that away from the person so that the grief that you um, obviously know a lot about and the burdens that people carry get shifted and their soul can speak, their spirit can shine. I got a connection with him. He was on the page. His light, the light in his eyes turned on. Um, I was able to um, get that a portrait to him. He was really excited with it. It ends up that he didn't recover. He actually ended up dying um, in the hospital for the last few weeks. He used that portrait as a way to connect with all his friends and his loved ones because he was himself touched by the loving kindness of his own eyes looking back at him. Like he is able to make his own connection with that loving kindness that had now sh was now shining from his face. But that's not where the story ends. The reason I'm telling you this story is because like I said, I'd never met this man, but um, after he died, his wife called me to you know, say thanks for the portrait. Um, I heard you had an experience with him when you painted him and she wanted to know more because now he was gone. And so we had a heart to heart about the experiences that I had with him, having never met him, what his burdens were, that he felt like a salesman always had to put a, a, a mask on. She said he was a salesman. So she confirmed all the experiences. Uh, we had a really good connection that showed us that, you know, we all have a spirit that is as much part of our being as our physical selves. That night I went to bed. In the morning when I woke up, there was a man singing in my head. And um, it was a beautiful song, the snow is on the roses, I can't sing. So I knew I can't sing and I knew I couldn't be writing this song, but I had never heard it. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, who's singing to me? Before I got out of bed, I typed it into my phone and on YouTube, I immediately found the song and it was, the snow is on the roses, by Sonny James, and it was from 1963. And I, I was like, who loves me so much that they want to sing to me? And I asked my husband, do you know Sonny James? Is, is this making any sense to you? I asked everybody all day, nobody knew. And it began to dawn on me that it wasn't a message that was actually for me. It was a message because I had been preoccupied the day before with the story of this man, his name was Bob. And my heart had been so open in connecting with his wife uh, I started to dawn on me that it was him singing in my head, using my, you know, body to get through to his wife, saying, I'm still alive. I'm not, I'm just not, you know, in this world, in this body anymore. So it took me five days to um, get the courage to call her because I had no idea how she would relate to any of this. When I called her, and, and in those five days, I kept double checking on myself, as you do, because things are spiritual. You always want proof for him somehow. And I was like asking anybody, you know, Sonny James, no one knew. When I finally called her, I said, I hope you don't mind me calling you, but do you know Sonny James? Oh yes, he was our favorite artist. And so that was my first confirmation. And I said, well, so I launched into the story and I said, I believe this is a message from your husband for you. Would you mind listening to the song? 
So she um, was a little nervous, but she went and listened to the song and called me back a half hour later, completely in tears, because the song's lyrics were about the bluebird flew away when the snow was on the roses. I am not with you anymore, but our love will last forever. You know, paraphrasing, obviously, since I'm not musical. She said when he had died, um, that day was the first snow of the season. And she remembered the vivid memory of looking at the flower pots outside and seeing the snow on the flowers. And she said she knew in that moment that it was her husband sending her a message that um, he had transitioned to the spiritual realm and he was giving her the feedback how much she still loves her and the love is not gone. The next day she called me back and said, I did a little bit more digging. Um, what I found out is that Sonny James himself died on the birthday of my husband. And that was the final confirmation she had that it was really him connecting through me to her. And what was striking to me is I didn't know the song, so it wasn't coming from my subconscious. I had never met this man. I didn't even know any of his characteristics. And yet that for me was my most solid proof that there's so much that we don't know. There's a spiritual realm where people truly are still alive. They can connect and it doesn't have to be understood and it doesn't have to be uh, coming from our own subconscious or explained away all the time. And um, once that language found a part of my life, I started to feel more full and more flowing. And that has been the driving force for this children's book, because I recognize my own journey coming from being afraid of all these experiences and trying to take it personally and think I was weird. And I don't know, there just there was a language that was really a, 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 a challenge for me. Making it natural, letting life be a continuum, letting ourselves trust that life goes on. You don't lose who or what you love while you have to process grief, obviously, since I believe it's a language of the body and you have to fill in the void of the physical loss. There's a comfort to the heart knowing that you can translate the language to one of spirit where you can still communicate through love, through memories, through, through promptings, through inspiration and keep the connection going. And that was so valuable to me that I wanted to create this book for that reason. Fantastic. Ma Maria Antoinette, we, we were running a little bit short on time. And um, so but no, I, no, this was great. fascinating. This is a, it's a wonderful conversation. Wonderful conversation. They always flies by. This is how our shows go. It's awesome. so time, time just flies by because we all get talking and sharing stories. Yes. And, and it's awesome. Yes, thank you. Um, but I would like to, before we're out of here, I would like you to be able to share with our listeners how they can connect with you and with your work, uh, because I think that's an important piece to having you here with us. Well, thank you. Um, I have a website. It is M-A-K, my initials, fineart.com. And I am on Facebook and Instagram with the same handle. It's M-A-K, fine art. And um, I, I would love to hear from anybody who wants to connect and, and have further conversations. Great. Marie Antoinette, we want to thank you for being a guest here on Let's Talk Death and for sharing the inspiration, the story, and the experiences behind your book. Thank you for having me. I, I hope I didn't talk too much and too fast. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> no, okay. I, I, think our, I think our listeners are going to, going to appreciate very much uh what thank you shared you. today and so we appreciate you and and i want to thank those who joined us for this episode of let's talk death if you would like to learn more about heal grief just visit us at healgrief.org uh, at healgrief.org you can learn more about all of the programs and resources available at heal grief including our national network of support for grieving young, young adults called actively moving forward and if you know of a bereaved adult refer them to the amf app where adults of all ages connect with others experiencing a similar death loss. And last, make sure to sign up on healgrief.org to receive our newsletter for links of future episodes of Let's Talk Death. So with that, again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time on Let's Talk Death.